One. This happened a few hours ago, and I'm still a little shaken up. I don't think I'll be able to sleep tonight and feel the need to talk about what happened. A little background. My mom owns a boutique which has been going strong for five years now. Tonight was her anniversary party, which was held at the store. Quite a few of her friends and employees were there, just having a good time. Being a 17-year-old male, I didn't want to spend all day in a boutique. I spent the day with some friends and left just as it began to get dark. I decided to stop by the shop party and say hi to mom and her friends. On the way over there, I noticed it was a full moon. Turns out to be quite the coincidence, since everybody says full moons bring out the weirdos. I enter the store, and everything's going great. My mom's laughing with her friends, one of my buddies is actually there playing guitar for them. His dad is there as well, who I also get along with. I began talking to my mom's friends, who were asking me all the usual questions that friends of parents ask. I was actually having a pretty good time. Then a large man, looked to be in his twenties, came in. He was well dressed, clean cut, and appeared to be in a good mood. My first thought was, he's in here to buy something for a girlfriend. He goes up to a group of mom's friends and casually asks, Are there any demons in here? Everyone looks at him, obviously puzzled. What? Someone asks. A little louder, he says, I'm looking for demons. Are you demons? My mom and a couple of her friends approached him, but I couldn't fully hear what they were saying. In a smart-ass tone, the man yells, Should I call you demons or should I call you bitches? That's when my mom and her group snapped back, demanding he leave. Are you kicking me out? Am I not welcome here? He keeps repeating these questions. My mom didn't back down. She just kept looking straight up into this guy's eyes. Adrenaline kicked in. I started fearing for my mom's safety. I was carrying my pocket knife and somehow my brain decided it was too short to do any real damage. At this point, I'm already moving towards him. On my way, I notice a large liquor bottle, which I instinctively arm myself with. I'm coming up on his side, but one of my mom's friends, Amy, is between us. I reach my arm around her and try to move her out of the way. She doesn't budge. and starts trying to calm me down. This man is still going at it with my mom, calling her a bitch and threatening her. He kept saying things like, I'm gonna have to come back here and finish this. Even though Amy is still between us, I have a clear shot at the guy. The bottle was very round and didn't have a long enough neck to use as a handle. So I cock it back as best I could about to slam it on his head. Oh my god, Therese Texan's gonna hit him. I freeze, he turns and faces my direction. But strangely, not directly at me. Who's Therese Texan? I want to see Therese Texan. He repeated those questions several times. Then my mom starts calling out for me to come over, though there was no fear in her voice. I prepared my arm for a second attempt at a strike but several of my mom's friends got in between us. Somehow, Barbara, one of my mom's friends, started calmly talking to the guy. They started talking about Jesus, and he yells, Jesus is a girl! Barbara responded with, All right, sorry. God bless you. He seemed to get annoyed and said, It's Jehovah! Jehovah bless me! Okay, sorry. Jehovah bless you. I am Jehovah. She got him to walk out of the store with her. Adrenaline and panic-filled me tried to follow them since I was still intent on smashing the bottle over his head. But Barbara turned around and told me to stay inside, so I did. I stood there and looked out the glass door as she talked him down. Eventually they hugged and he walked off into the night. My mom called the area security guard and he came to the shop almost instantly. We told him what happened, and he went out and did a quick search for him. He didn't find him. He told us, All the weird ones come out this time of year. That's when I mentioned the full moon. After that, everything went back to normal. Truth be told, I was still pretty shaken up, 
Still am, obviously. I found a hammer under the counter, and sat by the door the rest of the night. Whenever one of the women would leave, I'd escort them out to the car, and make sure they left safe. I keep going over what happened in my mind. Even though I know the situation ended perfectly, no one hurt, and there was no physical contact. I keep regretting not hitting the guy. I take martial arts, but I'm pretty lightweight. This guy was a lot bigger than me, so I know it's stupid of me to want to have initiated a fight with him. It's just hard hearing someone call your mom a bitch. And threaten her right in front of you. I'm just glad I was there to help. The weird thing was, he appeared perfectly sober. I'm almost positive that he has a mental illness and was off his meds. I volunteered to go up to the shop during the evenings and sit with whoever's working. I guess I'll update this if anything else happens. Though well, I hope it doesn't. Update. I got some sleep last night and woke up a lot more relaxed than I was when I wrote this. The comments here helped me understand that I should have no regrets about the situation. I've crossed out the part about me regretting not escalating the situation. That sounds really stupid just typing it out. I think I can stop obsessively thinking about what I could have done differently. Thanks everyone for talking some sense into me. I needed it. 2. This happened years ago, but I still think of it often and refer to it as my scariest story. Sorry if it's really long too for you. I've told this story so much there's a cadence way I love to tell it. I was 20, and I'd just gotten my first car, Ford Mustang Convertible. It wasn't actually worth the price I paid, but I dearly loved it. My favourite thing in the world was to drive late at night on abandoned roads. And I was even more in love with it when I was 20 than now. I decided to take my car for a drive, and bear with me as I describe the roads to you because... It does have bearing, I promise. I lived in the Denver metro area in Colorado at the time, and my favorite roads were the mountain roads. This time, however, I wanted to stay in range of cell service. I had been talking to a new beau. So I drove down to Golden to follow Highway 93 along the front range up to Broomfield or Boulder. It's usually a pretty good and solitary drive at night, and as it was around 1 a.m., I knew I'd have the road to myself. All was going well. I had passed the road work and cop at the 72nd Street Junction and decided to get off a road in Broomfield that would take me east, perpendicular to Highway 93, down a looping, hilly street until I reached Indiana Street. Indiana parallels Highway 93 until it ends against a road further south, closer to where my home was. As I was turning on to Indiana... I saw the first cars I'd see other than the cop at 72nd and Highway 93. There was a large diesel pickup in front of me, and a red hatchback in front of them, also turning south onto Indiana. The hatchback, however, was going frustratingly slow. Indiana Street is a very hilly road, speed limit is 50 or 55, and there's only two lanes, north and south. The truck decided after a while of us tooling behind the hatchback at 25 miles per hour to cross the double yellow and go around the hatchback. They sped off into the distance, risking the low visibility of the hills, got back over and disappeared to my sight. The hatchback hadn't changed speed, and I decided to hang out behind them because the night was fine. I was in no rush, and I was scared of crossing the double yellow. Death Proof is my favourite car movie, but the images of head-on collisions never go away from me. I was confused at this point about the motives of the hatchback driver, but it still didn't seem too horrible, so I stayed a car length back and waited, going about 25 miles per hour still. I checked my phone only to find it was dead, and as I had only recently bought the car, I didn't have a charger with me for the cigarette port. This made me even more uneasy. When the hatchback slammed their brakes and came to a complete stop, and I couldn't see an animal or anything to warrant it, I was freaked out enough to overcome my fears. I crossed the double yellow and sped up to pass them. But they sped up too. 
Thinking it was a mistake, I sped up more, reaching the actual speed limit of 50 or 55. They matched me, and I was swiveling my head, trying to see into their driver's side window and looking out for incoming headlights at each hilltop. I sped up more, this time reaching 65, and still, nothing gives. They're matching me and keeping me from getting over in front of them. I slowed down, backing off, but they slowed down too. Finally, scared out of my mind, I punched the gas, bringing me up to 80 and slipped back over the double yellow. They'd try to match my speed, but I'd been significantly ahead of them for long enough to get over. Although I was scared of scraping bumpers, they were so close. I don't know what I expected, but when they started bumping the back of my car with theirs, I was in full freakout mode. I knew that 70 second was coming up, that if I took a right on it, I could get back to Highway 93 and the safety of the cop. So I turned my blinker on far before the juncture to let this crazy person know I intended to get out of their way for good. They didn't back off. If I slowed down, the pressure against my back bumper merely increased. We were still barreling along at a white knuckle speed of 65 to 70. And we passed 72 without me being able to turn off Indiana. The next road coming up was Lading Gulch Road. And to my surprise, they started to back off. I flicked my blinker without thinking, wanting to get away from them ASAP. But of course they followed me onto the road, continuing to press at my back bumper until they were going 60 in a 45, with no real street lamps and lots of curves. I couldn't remember if Laden Gulch Road went all the way to 93, but I was praying it did when I started to see cones and signs of road work along the side of the road. Suddenly I saw a road closed sign, moved off to the left of the road, as if it had been in the middle earlier that day, and I instinctively slowed down, thinking about cartoon characters flying off the edge of a cliff where a bridge used to be. Luckily the hatchback behind me slowed down too. We slowed down to a reasonable 35 and I thought the danger was over when the road ahead turned into gravel and suddenly I was driving past mounds of dirt and gravel several times bigger than my car. I tried to make a U-turn, but the piles were too close together and I ended up horizontal, trapped between three piles to either side and behind me. Ever since I'd gotten in front of it, they'd had their brights on and I couldn't make out a face or a license plate. Now as they drove up the middle of the road perpendicular to me, I was blinded and panicked. I tried to think of what would make them, whoever they were, hesitate or think twice. I started looking cocky, almost smirking, eyebrow raised. I'm a girl, so seeing a girl who should be hella freaked out, looking amused and self-assured, would be weird in this situation. I imagined I had a gun or some secret up my sleeve they didn't want to mess with. There was a really long silence during which I started to wonder what if they had a gun, what is going on, etc. Finally I heard their car door quietly shut. The silence, lack of yelling, road rage and explanations freaked me out so much that I decided to risk driving my car directly at one of the piles hoping to go slanted across the side of the pile and around their car. I kept my face locked into fuck you doing here sort of face and hit the gas, looking at where I presumed they were the whole time. I was still pretty blinded and couldn't see much but bright light or shadows. My car miraculously made it and I tore out of the dead end roadwork zone and back onto Indiana Street. I looked for pursuit but didn't see anyone, and made it safely home without seeing many other cars that night. The next day I went back to the area with my brother and sister, and the road close sign was back across the middle of the road, and no longer at the site. I tried to call the police, but it was confusing, because one, I didn't have a lot of useful info beyond Red Hatchback, and two, there was a little girl, ten, missing around the same time. Jessica Ridgeway. 
and all resources were on the manhunt. They eventually found her body in Leiden Gulch. But the teen, 19, accused did not own a red hatchback, so I'm at a loss. Edit, and three, the area it happened in was county police jurisdiction, not town or city police, and they were hard to get hold of. I'm just very grateful nothing happened to me that night, and very sorrowful for the little girl. 3. The college I attend has a history as a party college, but also a record of assaults, muggings, break-ins, rapes, etc. Just this year, two students have been shot, and an upstanding member of the punk rock community was killed by a stray gunshot when a house party turned violent. I say all that to let you know that I am aware of all of this, and yet I'm still here. I don't have a whole lot of choice thanks to money, but I'm doing my best to stay alert while trying to finish my degree. I also work on campus, which, until very recently, seemed like the safest place to be, the university newspaper. There are journalists here at all hours, and I only work from noon until five. I've never had an issue in the parking lot, which is where I'm most wary. It was in the damn bathroom where I had my scare. There's not a staff bathroom because the building is part of the school, so it's a two-seater for the women's and, I presume, a similar setup for the men's. The bathroom is maybe 25 feet down the hall from the door to the paper, so not a long walk and not at all out of earshot of all the conversation and bustle. Getting back to the aforementioned event from a few weeks ago, I was walking along to the bathroom, having left my keys and phone in my office because why not? The building is safe enough and I didn't think I'd need the little knife on my keyring. Until I noticed that there was a guy hanging out by the end of the hall, just five or so feet past the doors to the bathrooms. Initially, I ignored him. He was on his phone and I assumed he was waiting on someone. Or maybe just killing time. But something about him kept bothering me. He didn't look odd. Tall, skinny, dark hair. That was a little crazy. He looked like an unkempt and unattractive version of... Dan Avedan from The Game Grumps, if that helps. Like if Dan had a creepy, grimy cousin, I remember distinctively that he had a heather grey t-shirt with a band logo on it, but not which band. His jeans were filthy, but I spent a semester apiece in ceramics and blacksmithing. You can get really dirty at this school and not have the option to clean up before your next class if you're unlucky. But it was the fact that he wasn't really looking at the phone in his hand that really caught my attention. He wasn't looking at it, but around, and when he saw me, he immediately stood up straighter and started staring at me. I am not pretty. I am not really even that cute. I'm a bit overweight, and it's not carried in a shapely fashion. The best I can say for myself is that I do have a fairly nice rack, but yeah, that's about it. But he's staring at me, and I ignore it because of course I do. And even though I'm already thinking I should just keep going, then circle back to the office and wait to visit the bathroom, but I don't. I tell myself I'm making a big deal out of nothing. I tell myself he's just waiting on someone. And yeah, maybe he's leering at my boobs, but he hasn't said or done anything, so I should just be chill about it. Except as I go into the bathroom, I glance back and see he's walking toward me. I step into the bathroom which is basically a squat rectangle with a little protruding square where the door opens onto the hall, and then step to the side by the mirror. This puts me out of immediate view, should someone walk in, and I'm only standing there for maybe 10 seconds before the door opens. Normally, these doors have hinges that scream like they're the victim in a slasher movie, but the door is being opened so slowly that it doesn't make a damn sound. He steps in like he's sneaking, putting his feet down quiet and slow, and his eyes are fixed forward on the stalls. When he sees that both the stall doors are still open, and the toilets themselves are unoccupied, he stopped and stared for a second, then noticed me. He jumped back about a foot, 
then turned and bolted from the bathroom. I followed him out just in time to see him sprint down the hall, take a left, and then book it out of the building. I haven't seen him since, and I did report it. But of course I was told by campus security that the cameras in the halls aren't actually active because they don't have enough staff to monitor them all. Hey everyone, Hellfreezer here, and thank you very much for listening to Three True Scary Stories, episode 122. As always, I will just remind you, the channel name is Hellfreezer, that is my username and the name of the channel, the address is King of the Cities. If it does not say that, it is not my channel, and I am not affiliated with any other channels in any way. Okay, moving on from that. I just want to thank you all for listening. I'd also like to say again, thank you so much for your, your birthday wishes. It really did. It brightened uh, a very sleepy day for me because I hadn't had a lot of rest, a lot of rest that day. And it really did cheer me up. I also want to thank you for the wonderful feedback and all the, the, the views you've given me on my recent 30 story special. Now, those videos are a massive amount of work, but uh, I always know it's worth it because this, they're so appreciated. I'm sorry there wasn't a glitch video this week. I have got a few stories there for one, so we'll probably have one next week. I'll actually shoot for next Thursday for for that. Uh, but I was kind of at a loss as to what to do today. So, hence, three true scary stories. Usually goes down well in my experience. I have been looking into some other things, though. I did mention a while trying to do like, positive experiences. I've been looking at a few here and there, although I really need to start looking further afield than Reddit. Uh, Reddit is a fantastic site. It's a great resource for people like myself. And, of course, I do get a lot of stories sent in by subscribers, which is amazingly helpful as well. But I need to try and find other sites for stories, other places for stories and experiences. But, uh... I'm coming up blank. I'm sure there are forums and things out there, so I'll certainly look into that over the coming weeks. Because uh, I've got I've got a folder saved on my computer marked stock stuff, right? And when I first started doing narrations, that was one of the first things I did. I thought, okay, I'm going to need resources to make these videos. So I found a bunch of sites that had images, music, video, I know I don't use video much, but I do have resources I can check for if I need to that would uh, allow me to of of that would allow me to make the videos so that had content that would allow me to make the videos. But Reddit is my biggest source for stories, and I really should have a folder just for stories. So I'll be looking further afield for that. Okay, I think I'm going to head off for now. So until next time, thank you very much for listening and take very good care of yourselves.